Great, we're live and welcome to another episode of Machine Medicine's interview series uh, centering around the brain and neuromodulation. We're delighted this week to have uh, Professor Konstantin Slavin um, from the University of Illinois in Chicago. Um, thanks for being with us, Konstantin, and, and perhaps you'd start off by giving us a short introduction about your own background and, and current sort of interests and activities. Of course, thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here and pleasure speaking with you, Jonathan. And the, um, uh, my name is Konstantin Slavin, and I'm a neurosurgeon in Chicago, um, born and raised in the Soviet Union, you know, went to medical school in my hometown of Baku in Azerbaijan, had my residency in Moscow, and then moved to the United States, had residency again in Chicago, and, uh, and have been on staff uh, in the University of Illinois for many years, started my practice a little more than 20 years ago in 01, and have been doing it ever since. Um, do a lot of um, neurosurgical interventions, but my specialty is what's called functional and stereotactic neurosurgery. So I deal with conditions that are considered functional neurosurgical issues. Those include chronic pain, movement disorders, epilepsy, psychiatric conditions. And that's uh, something I specialize in. I've been involved in a variety of neurosurgical and professional societies and president of American Society of Stereotactic Functional Neurosurgery at some point, and now I'm in the World Society as a vice president, and I'm deeply involved in neuromodulation. So I guess I'm president-elect of International Neuromodulation Society, which is obviously a great honor. And, um, and, and this is something that I do because I really enjoy it. Fantastic. You know, that's great to hear. And, and you know, I've, I've, I've had some sort of experience with the neuro, neurosurgical fraternity. In fact, uh, my brother is a neurosurgeon. And so I know that um, among neurosurgeons, they often there's often a bit of snootiness about functional neurosurgery, like it's not really proper neurosurgery. So what was it that what was it that attracted you to this particular branch of neurosurgery? I think it's uh, it's probably the most fascinating part of neurosurgery. The um, the functional neurosurgery has traditionally been uh, uh, considered the most um, uh, thoughtful part of our specialty, and this is something that requires a lot of. Uh, calculation, thinking, and most importantly, dealing with very complex patients. Mm -hmm. Because functional disorders are not something that happens um, suddenly. It's not uh, trauma or subarachnoid hemorrhage or even brain tumor that comes from nowhere. Mm -hmm. This is something that patients develop over the years and something that stays with them for most of their life. And, uh, and therefore, the main goal of our interventions is uh, ideally to cure them. But but that rarely happens. Usually we are just aiming at improvement of quality of life, which as you may imagine, what can be quite rewarding because uh, um, uh, saving life is obviously a very noble intervention and I and my colleagues do it all the time for other neurosurgical issues. But in functional neurosurgery, we are improving quality of life. We're making people's life more enjoyable, less painful, less disabling in many ways. And, uh, and that by itself is very, uh, um, optimistic field. Gotcha, gotcha. And let's just uh, let's just sort of expand on that a little bit to make sure that first of all I understand, but anyone else that may be listening, because the, the word functional has got several uses in in medicine and in ne neurology. And I and I know often in in neurology, at least uh, when people talk about a functional disorder, they often mean something that may be well, perhaps not fashionable or politically correct to say that it's kind of made up or put on, but uh, but we're, here you're talking about conditions about which there's really no doubt that there's a serious pathological process underlying it, such as uh, depression or, or chronic pain, right? These are, these are really definitely very impactful conditions, right? Of course. And, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the, uh, when you talk about something being functional, people immediately assume that that may be psychogenic or uh, completely mm. non-existent and uh, as an example of... Uh, malingering and so forth. But realistically, functional disorders have been uh, set aside um, in the past uh, because of relatively normal anatomical uh, issues. So there was no organic substrate for either pain or movement disorder, or psychiatric conditions or epilepsy. And that's why it was all grouped into this functional disorder category. But functional mm -hmm. neurosurgery is essentially improving the function. Now we know that all of these conditions, be that chronic pain or Parkinson's disease or epilepsy or even psychiatric conditions, they do have substrate. It may mm. not be uh, organic in terms of anatomical abnormalities, but there's neurochemical disturbances. There's some networks in the brain that um, are out of control. <clears throat> there's a lot of um, um, uh, neurotransmitter changes 
that that happen at different stages of disease and therefore the interventions make sense because we uh, uh, we really trying to normalize the circuitry of the brain we're trying to uh, eliminate the symptoms and perhaps the source of those uh, issues uh, in the nervous system. So that's yeah. that's why neurosurgery for functional disorders does make sense. Gotcha. Yeah. So even if these things are, are, are or historically were invisible at the macro anatomical level, once you start to look at things like the the, mic, the micro, as you might call it, the micro anatomical and the network level, then it becomes very evident that there there are indeed consistent. Uh, uh, differences between the pathological population and the, as, as it were, healthy population. So, Constantine, if I can ask you, what would you say, is the, the, if you were to sort of try and illustrate a success story in in this approach, functional neurosurgery, what would you say is the, the, the greatest success story that we've had to date? Oh, there are many. There are many. As a matter of fact, the fact that we are able to uh, uh, effectively control symptoms of many movement disorders, like, for example, mm -hmm. Then something comes to mind, it's like deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease or essential tremor. It's been around for decades and it's remarkably successful in controlling the symptoms. The, uh, the advances in surgery for epilepsy, they have been really tremendous. And the, uh, um, the, 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 the symptomatic improvement and even cure rate are significantly higher now with introduction of uh, uh, laser technology and the uh, stereotactic EEG and all, all the interventions that we can tailor for the patient because mm -hmm. another functional thing that we do is actually functional imaging. So we can have functional yeah. MRIs, we can have PET scans and those, those show very subtle changes uh, in the uh, connectivity of the brain or chemical abnormalities that probably will not be visible on anatomical or structural evaluation. Gotcha. And so, and so would you say over the last two decades since you've been at least practicing in the USA, where I'm sure you have access to many of these cutting edge techniques that you 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 would say that you've perceived an increase in the uh, in the degree to which these approaches and techniques are influencing your clinical practice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Since I started, a lot of these interventions have become standard of care and deep brain stimulation, for example, is definitely standard of care for advanced Parkinson's disease. We have seen significant uh, increase in the rate of acceptance for um, interventional treatment, surgical treatment of pain. And that includes mm -hmm. spinal cord stimulation, the intrathecal pumps for pain and spasticity, the, mm -hmm. um, uh, all kinds of neuromodulation devices for treatment of epilepsy, depression, uh, pain, obviously, uh, and, and pretty much everything else. And there's uh, the list is growing and uh, our understanding of the conditions is becoming better. Our um, individualization of the treatment is significantly better now. So it's because we know that one size doesn't fit all and what works for one patient may not work for the other. Um, and then our uh, attempts to address the, the source of the condition seems to be uh, progressing quite fast. As a matter of fact, the, um, uh, there's now pioneering research and, for example, using stem cells uh, for treatment of Parkinson's disease, because if we can reverse the course of the condition and reestablish some uh, dopamine producing cells in the brain, then perhaps we can not just concentrate on symptomatic improvement, but maybe stop the progression of the entire condition. I mean, there's a lot of research in the field of Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative disorders, and there's definitely plenty of innovation in the field of surgery for pain. So these are the things that just come to mind, and but but yeah. list is long. The specialty is large, and and the um, the professional journals and meetings uh, pretty much concentrate on this, and and it's it's a, it's a great time to be in the middle of. It. Yeah, no, absolutely, and maybe maybe we can focus in on on just one of those to kind of sort of try and unpack it a little bit. So so in, in the case of pain, I think it's kind of an interesting example because they, we have um, now evidence based non invasive. Uh, neuromodulatory approaches uh, for pain. We have spinal cord stimulation. We have uh, motor cortex stimulation, and then, you know, perhaps the most full-on approach, deep brain stimulation. And um, and I said, what are, what are the kind of pros and cons here? Do, aren't, aren't we really moving to a situation where everybody is going for non-invasive uh, neuromodulation, or, or do we think there are situations in which that just won't cut the mustard? I think this is a very good uh, um, uh, topic for discussion because ultimately, yes, I'm very much convinced that all the surgical interventions for the um, treatment of chronic pain will be eventually 
abandoned and substituted by non-invasive treatments. I mean, I'm sure 100 years from now, people will look at us and say, can you imagine these people are actually implanting something into the human body to control the pain, perhaps creating even more pain just by in introducing some tools into the body to, su to suppress something which can be easily controlled from outside. So, but right now we're not there. As a matter of fact, the non-invasive treatment is something we try first. And if it doesn't work, only then we progress to invasive um, uh, procedures and interventions. Mm. And therefore, the, uh, there's a significant need for uh, effective and safe approaches for chronic pain, particularly for refractory cases that have already failed medications, mm. non-invasive treatments, uh, therapy, and so forth. So the, 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 there's plenty of room for surgery for pain. And, and what you mentioned are definitely good examples of what we use now because they are uh, implanted stimulators, peripheral nerve stimulators, spinal cord stimulators, uh, motor cortex stimulators, deep brain stimulators. They are all examples of how we're trying to affect the pain through uh, electrical signals. So we're putting devices that uh, can either normalize the um, the conductance, conductance of uh, information or um, perhaps suppress some of the pathways that transmitting uh, painful uh, signals. So those yeah. are the things that, that stimulators do. And um, interestingly enough, the spinal cord stimulation is pretty much standard of care, widely used worldwide for, for a variety of different indications. The motor cortex stimulation is very far from that. It's very rarely used for very specific indications. and. Um, uh, almost nowhere in the world I know that this particular modality is fully approved on regulatory level. And deep brain stimulation is, is actually a very fascinating story because deep brain stimulation for pain was probably second um, uh, arena for second application of deep brain stimulation. The first being psychiatry, second was pain, then came movement disorders. And uh, movement disorders, it became standard. It's safe, it's effective, we know about that. Pain, on the other hand, um, uh, did not turn out to be as effective, even though it was quite safe. And therefore, it was almost completely abandoned just maybe 20 years ago. Now we see some resurrection or renaissance of interest towards deep brain stimulation for pain, because there are some specific indications when this could be extremely successful. There are some uh, cases of cluster headaches when we stimulate hypothalamic area with uh, brain mm. stimulator. There's definite diffuse neuropathic or nociceptive pains that may respond to stimulation of very specific centers in the brain. Mm. Um, and that's something that is a subject of investigations now. The, their, um, the lack of regulatory approval makes it somewhat challenging yeah. to get things going because there's, when there's no regulatory approval, there's usually no insurance coverage. So we have to find some uh, pathways for patients to get this modality. And then there should be some ongoing research in terms of data collection, analysis, mm. trying to find best candidates for this, maybe try to find ideal target for certain indications. And, and that is a work in progress. Yeah, no, that, that is, it's very, very interesting in, indeed. And one of the things I thought was particularly interesting when I was reading about, um, about uh, DBS for pain is the, the uh, anterior cingulate cortex as a target and and this idea that actually maybe the maybe it, it's not actually uh it's not actually relieving the pain so much as the effective component so that people simply care less so it's kind of a beautiful example of a functional intervention where you don't even have to deal with the pain because you just stop them from caring about it i mean maybe that's not a great thing to do uh, in the long term but uh but fascinating yeah, there's, there's definitely room for that you know interestingly enough majority of our current neuromodulation procedures on in the brain uh, stemmed from our past experience with um, destructive surgery. So um, the, there's a long history of uh, what's called singularity, which is a procedure when there's very selective destruction of the um, cingulum um, and cingular gyrus, uh, usually done on both sides, for treatment of um, a variety of affective conditions. You know, it's been used for mm -hmm. treatment of depression, of obsessive compulsive disorder. The uh, chronic pain was one of the indications for that particularly the most refractory cases when patients are so disabled and the pain is so diffused that really nothing else worked. So they, for them, the singulotomy did definitely relieve this affective part. And affective part is not just an overlay of pain. It's a big component of the pain perception because in general, the pain, as you can imagine, has two major components. One is somatic, kind of tells you where it hurts, and one is affective, which is a negative connotation of pain, which is all this unpleasureness uh, of pain, all this uh, discomfort that people experience. This all this emotional overlay, emotional component of it, which is definitely regulated and uh, um, 
probably centered in the limbic system. And in the limbic system, which singular is a big part of it, there's, is a, 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 there's definitely a target for, for our interventions. And if we can um, control this um, by deep brain stimulation, which is non-destructive option, then it will definitely be very attractive. It's hard to say who are the best candidates for that. It's also hard to say how um, universally successful this approach will be. But it is one of those directions which are being investigated now and maybe will present with some yet another option for otherwise hopeless patients. Mm, yeah, no, very interesting. And, and one of the one of the things that I thought was also very interesting was a, um, the the lack of kind of uh, the lack of, of controlled trial data here and, and this sort of secondary issue, which seems to compound the problem, which is that the patients that are getting fed through to DBS for pain management tend to be those that have failed on everything else beforehand. So they're kind of the hardest cases. So trying to establish an evidence base on this population of, you know, refractory, multiple previous therapeutic attempts that have all failed. Um, and so this is, and then trying to sort of build an evidence base on it's very typically quite small numbers, in a very, very challenging situation. What do you see as kind of, what do you see as a, an approach to kind of deal with that? I mean, should we be just more registries of data collection or what do we need? All of this. I think everything that you mentioned definitely makes sense. And I think the, uh, there will be some uh, um, effort to, to, to um, unify the experience that's being collected worldwide, perhaps creating some registry or perhaps some, creating some database uh, hmm. um, uh, for, for, the, for the old interventions that are done in that direction. Uh, ideally, yes, we all would like to have multiple randomized prospective studies with uh, placebo or sham controlled or even comparing different, different interventions to each other, um, uh, which will probably create the highest level of evidence. But right now, I think we're quite far from that because we need to mm -hmm. establish um, a certain degree of comfort among patients and physicians for this indication and, uh, and for this procedure in terms of the actual target which we will uh, be stimulating and what parameters we will be using. So right now, I think we are in one of the preliminary stages of finding these prerequisites, which hopefully will translate into a larger scale studies. And those studies will create an evidence that we all need. Now, it's, it's, uh, I think it's an illusion to say that unless there's covered in randomized study, there's, there, there, there will not be evidence. But there, there are certain things that probably would not require that type of um, uh, approach. But, but just uh, accumulation of data and ability to process them in a, in a constructive way, something that will come with um, practical recommendations uh, and at the same time showing uh, feasibility and safety of intervention. This is something that I think will move things forward because the, uh, there's big need for that. I mean, the refractory pain, despite variety of things available today, is still a huge issue. And we're talking about all kinds of pain. We're talking about neuropathic pain from variety of conditions, uh, from neuropathies and uh, previous surgeries and so forth, complex regional pain syndromes. We have the post-traumatic pains, plus entire world of headaches uh, for a variety of different etiologies. There's uh, yeah. all kinds of back pains people experience from many, many different issues, including just natural aging and the generation that we encounter. Mm -hmm. And many other medical and neurological conditions that have pain as a part of their presentation. So just think about cancer pain, for example. This is a huge area where there is main, there are major need for, for like um, uh, reliable and predictable uh, intervention. Because we already understand kind of as a society and individually that opioids may not necessarily be the best solution for every patient. As a matter of fact, there's major dangers uh, in uh, chronic use of opioids. And even though for certain indications they are still the best treatment, for majority of patients, I think the preference would be to avoid uh, the cloudiness of mind and all the other side effects that we give as medications and proceed with something which will be perhaps immediate, perhaps more radical, and even sometimes more risky, but but definitely more uh, um, um, uh, result uh, productive in terms of the uh, achieving the, the the results. So I think I think there's there's plenty of, of work to do, and I think what you mentioned, starting from registries and starting from creating protocols of sorts, probably the first step, and then proceeding with more organized multi-center evaluations in randomized or non-randomized fashion, but at least prospective data collection. 
uh, will be the way to create mm. this level of confidence. Do, you, do are there any initiatives that you see kind of pushing in that direction? I know well, there's one registry I'm aware of, the Rad PD uh, registry, which is being led by uh, Jui Jiminis Shahed at, uh, at Mount Sinai in New York. But are there other ones that you think are pushing? That seems to be pushing in the right direction. But other, are there Absolutely. other Absolutely. There, there, there's there's quite a few research projects going on right now. The uh, the experience of uh, multiple centers in the United States. Uh, we still have very large uh, experience that has been accumulated over the years in Oxford um, uh, with Dr. Aziz and Dr. Green, the, the large team over there who is, uh, uh, who've who been dedicating themselves to use of brain stimulation for treatment of pain for many years. Uh, their experience is very valuable and, and used worldwide. Um, and then there's some, um, um, uh, the, our societies are interested in pursuing that as well. So we are have been discussing possibility of creating multi-center study under the aegis of the uh, uh, World Society, for example. And, and it's uh, right. something that will, will probably be um, uh, one of the priorities for the next decade or so, along with other mm -hmm. indications, because we have been talking about treatment of psychiatric conditions, the Tourette syndrome, the obsessive compulsive disorder, yeah. the, all the other issues. And I don't even want to talk about Alzheimer, which is a huge uh, frontier in uh, neuromodulation. So all of these yeah. things probably will be competing for neurosurgeons' attention, and uh, and I'm glad you're talking about this because raising awareness of this issue is probably the first step in getting things moving. It seems like a massive issue, and we it's one that we often discuss. What do you think? The, what do you think the major impediments are? Is it technical? Well, there are several. Is it there are several. There, there's, I mean, they're the, just the fact that we are. Um, we're dealing with quality of life that uh, that um, that probably makes it a bit, little bit less urgent because you know when you compete with life-saving issues, when you try to cure cancer or control the pandemics, I mean these are really kind of life or death type of issues. But the function is important, and I think they uh, uh, just just live longer but miserable. It, it's probably not a good way to go. So I, I think I think we should concentrate on making people's life more enjoyable and getting rid of uh, chronic diseases that result in severe pain or the pain itself probably is definitely a noble goal. But then the yeah. rest has to do with invasiveness of our interventions, yeah. all our attempts to make it more safe and uh, more palatable for patients because, you know, just imagine somebody tells you that you need to have holes drills in your head and, and wires sticking there, you know, it's probably distracting for some. But at the same time, it's you know if you know it's effective and you know it's safe, then perhaps that may be the way to go. So lower invasiveness of interventions will be will be playing a role here. The um, we haven't really touched upon the high cost of devices, but those are probably going to be um, justified in many ways. Plus, there's a lot of um, a push towards more affordable uh, neuromodulation technology, so that probably will make things somewhat easier. But then there's there's That's just scientific yeah. interest and there is some pressure from below. I mean, the patients are demanding to have something that will work for them. So, so mm -hmm. I think once, once it gets, gets to the people who distribute resources and um, create uh, funding for this type of intervention, then things will be easier. Yeah, uh, very, very interesting. Um, there seems to be a, uh, I mean, with regards to the kind of the cost of the hardware, there seems to be kind of like, uh, there seems to be perhaps two competing uh, sort of streams, and and one uh, push would seem to be for the you know reduction in cost and you know moving towards a situation where the, much like pacemakers, which are, are now you know a few thousand dollars each, um, and have very fairly similar functionality across manufacturers. But then on the other hand, a push for sort of increased complexity from a kind of let me say scientific or neurophysiological understanding, things like directional leads. And of course, you know, directional leads versus, say, monopolar leads is, is um, you know, going to be more expensive. So, do, how do you see? Do you see that circle being squared, or is this just a sort of tension that we is going to have to deal with going forward? Well, I think that will be a um, um, topic of many discussions in the future. Mm -hmm. I think what you mentioned definitely makes sense. I mean, monopolar is long gone you know we had the uh multi-contact devices present for like four decades sure. directional stimulation probably going to make even safer our interventions but but may not necessarily be needed for every indication 
there's even more um, uh, emphasis now on uh, um, uh, closed loop type of stimulation when we can record from the electrodes that we implant. So we can record yeah. information and use that information to adapt the stimulation parameters. So that definitely makes mm -hmm. more sense because having the same stimulation over and over again, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, it's really, it's, it's, it, it works, but, but it's not something that will be, will be used in the future. I, I definitely foresee the time when the devices will be turning off and on by themselves based on the underlying yeah. activity and the settings will be adjusted based on yeah. the patient's condition with some either sensors or some just yeah. smart algorithms that will adjust things uh, by themselves. So that inevitably will, will drive up the cost because these things will be more complex. But at the same time, I'm pretty sure that not every person needs super duper um, catalog of, of, of every, uh, every feature available. So I think yeah. there is some room for simpler devices, which can be used as a stepping stone, as introductory tool, and then based on the patient's specific needs, that simple device can be either upgraded or you know changed to something more complex if it definitely if it is beneficial. Mm -hmm. I, I'm strong believer that there will be some very simple introductory tools that will be used for screening patients and then uh, they will be changed to something else once once it's uh, those particular features are needed but leaving that aside yeah. i think that the cost effectiveness of neurosurgical interventions for treatment of functional um, uh, conditions has been shown over and over again even though things are considered expensive the, the, the price pretty much balances out within a year or two because of reduction in medication use, in emergency room visits, mm -hmm. in, in the care that patient receives, even in lost work time that gets uh, recouped by, uh, by controlling the symptoms. This is, has been mm -hmm. shown over and over again. So I think, I think the high cost uh, may be distractor at some point, but, but somebody has to look at the bigger you know, set of things and bigger picture and understand that this is definitely cost-effective interventions. And, so I think from that point of view, I think there's 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 quite a bit of understanding in the um, among decision making uh, faults, and I think this this mm. has not been an issue really. But but there is obviously a concern that you know not everybody can afford it in the first place, right? So there's there's certain yeah. difference between different parts of the world where neuromodulation has become standard and where neuromodulation yeah. is still very much unaffordable. So that hopefully will change as well. And there will be some uh, equalization in terms of the access to, to these modalities and perhaps different sets of pricing for different parts of the world based on their ability to pay. So that, that but really, I, I really don't want to, to, to dwell on the cost of it because I think the science um, uh, should be focusing on something that's more effective and more safe. Yeah. And I think this should be the driver of our innovation. And, yeah. uh, and I think that's what we're seeing now is a good example that things are actually working. The, the, my yeah. amount of progress in neuromodulation devices, even for the last 20 years, kind of my career, has been tremendous. You know, what I started with in, in late 90s um, is very different. And then when I show my, my colleagues or my residents how things looked back then, it's hard to imagine that we were able to accomplish anything with those simple things. Yeah. Right now, there are so many bells and whistles which are really making a difference. You know, that we do have quite a bit of comparative studies showing how the new innovations improve the effectiveness of devices, improve the uh, percentage of responders, improve the, um, uh, the ratio of uh, benefits versus side effects. What's called therapeutic window opens up quite a bit with, with introduction of devices like directional ones or new stimulation yeah. paradigms. That's, that's impressive. So I think I think we are we're on the verge of kind of even wider acceptance and uh, and future technological innovation probably will make it even better. Yeah, I mean, as you, and, and and if what happens, uh, uh, if things happen as, as you predicted that they would, that ultimately everything will become non-invasive and externally kind of uh, sort of delivered, um, then it's also sort of interesting to consider whether or not we'll actually converge to basically a standard architecture that's used for every single disease and the, and the plate and the thing that varies is actually the software so everyone will have a, everyone every condition will be treated with the same neuromodulatory usb as it were and then it's just the software that you load onto it that kind of um kind of determines what your treatment is so maybe obviously that's a slightly sci-fi um application but i think one of the really interesting sort of longer term possibilities it sounds like that's something that you might be sympathetic to
Right. I think I think it's 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 a long reach goals, and uh, I I'm pretty safe in terms of uh, the the my career and even my trainees. Yeah. I think there's plenty of work for us in terms of uh, interventions and invasive treatment. But ultimately, yes, I think there will be some way uh, to to modify the neural activity without without implants. And and whether or not it's going to be software or there's going to be some way to change things in a positive way without intervention at all. Uh, or just by some chemical neuromodulation. This is something we, we yet to see because they are, the medicine is evolving rapidly. And I think they're most likely it will be something that we cannot think of in, be that chemical or genetic or something else that, that just doesn't come to mind yet. But there yeah, are so yeah. many new things that are, are, are kind of fascinate me now that, for example, something like resorbable devices, something that you put in of course for some time and then device just resorbs and disappears so you don't have to worry about taking it out or or worrying about long-term effects or something that gets powered up by the by the person's own heat so you don't have to worry about battery and charging yeah and just we make heat all the time you know we have metabolic processes that create uh, uh, temperature and those things can power up our implants there's there's a lot of um, uh, biomarkers that we are are not aware of yet, or maybe we know them, but we don't know how to use them for something that will allow us to gauge the treatment or maybe modify it. Uh, so this is something that will probably be driving the functional neurosurgery among other fields uh, in the future. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So I'm conscious that the time is marching on, but it'd be interesting to to hear your uh, advice for say I, I don't know a young person that's coming out of say medical school and going into uh, me, uh, medicine, pra clinical practice now, and maybe con contemplating a career in neurosurgery. Is it, if you were if you were advising such a person now, what would you what would you suggest they take a look at? Where do you think the most exciting place to be working in, say, 10, 10 15 years is going to be when they say reach the apogee of their career? You think I, I think that the, the 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 field is very promising. I think there's plenty of work for us, and I think uh, independently of what that person will choose. There will be plenty of uh, opportunities to, to sharpen your mind and keep um, uh, involved in the frontier of developments. I think it's important to keep inquisitive approach. It, it's important to uh, yeah. be um, uh, ready and willing to, to change the paradigms and break some of the you know dogmas uh, in many ways. Uh, I I would be. Um, wrong to say that everybody has to go to functional neurosurgery because that's where the future is even though i strongly feel that this part of neurosurgery will probably will become most uh, uh needed and uh, most widely used as i'm very optimistic about eventual cure for everything else neurosurgery does today uh, but at the same time i'm very much respectful of people the decisions to go into spine or vascular neurosurgery or neuro-oncology or pediatric neurosurgery or any other mm -hmm. subspecialties of of neurosurgical practice, which are definitely just as interesting and fascinating. So, so my general advice to people who are just looking at this uh, as a start is keep your mind open, try all these fields, and then decide what matches best your um, uh, personality and your interests. Because you, the last thing you want to do is to do something that you don't enjoy. But once you find something that that clicks, that's what you stick with. But you don't know it until you try it. So I think it's important for people to go through all these subspecialties and then determine what uh, you uh, enjoy the most. And once you figure it out, then stick with it, do research, do um, um, uh, continuous you know, involvement in, in, in education and try to learn more, try to practice new things uh, and, and just keep going. Brilliant. Sound advice, I'm sure. Um, Professor Konstantin Slavin, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure to chat to you and, and albeit briefly, hear are some of your uh, valuable insights into the, the field today, uh, yesterday, and indeed tomorrow. So I look forward to catching up again. Thanks very much. Pleasure is mine. Thank